So typically our events are live, but however, with this COVID situation, of course, everything is virtual. But I just want to mention that, um, you know, by attending our events, not only do you get to meet other alumni, but it also helps you to stay very connected with UCLA. So whether your passion is UCLA athletics, leadership, scholarships, um, pursuing your own personal growth, or just want to travel with um, a group of alumni, by staying engaged with an alumni network, it really allows you to pursue those um, to pursue those interests and also continue and fuel your passion for UCLA. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Clyde Boyston. Clyde has been a physical therapist for over 25 years. He's an orthopedic clinical specialist and he received his mindfulness facilitation certification from UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center in 2017. In addition to his clinical work, he and his wife, who's also a physical therapist, own and operate Bell Wellness, which is a mind-body wellness center in Riverside, California. Clyde has offered um, mindfulness presentations and classes to companies such as Morgan Stanley, Kaiser Permanente, County of Riverside Office of Aging, and he held some day-long retreats for UC Riverside. More recently, Clyde was a mindfulness presenter at the 14th Annual PESI Rehab Summit in Las Vegas. It is my great honor, and I'm excited to introduce to you Mr. Clyde Boyston. Thank you so much, Monica, for the wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for choosing to carve out an hour on your Wednesday night to, uh, to join us here virtually and, and uh, explore mindfulness. And I apologize for the little technological issues that got us off to a little bit of a late start today. We have a wonderful team behind the scenes who were able to sort of troubleshoot and pull it all together. And I will tell you that that's a perfect example of all these times in life that we least expected that give us an opportunity to practice mindfulness because you never know what's going to pop up in the next moment. And we just, we just learn to kind of roll with the flow of life. When we can't change things, we just simply, we just simply uh, they say, swim, uh, was it, surf, the, surf the tide rather than swim against the waves. So I, again, I'm very, very happy to be sharing this time with you tonight. And um, my great passion for quite a number of years uh, has been mindfulness and meditation, not just from the, the uh, health benefits that it can provide, but also because as a physical therapist, when I was going through a very significant crossroads in my professional career many years ago, I think mindfulness is really what got me back on track. And I was really questioning whether I had chosen the right profession, the right path for my for my life, uh, my life work. And what it did was it turned me around in such a way, it was such a game changer for me, that I was able to go back to therapy with, with a renewed strength and a greater effectiveness. And so it's, it's a wonderful uh, blessing to be able to share some principles of mindfulness, uh, just because it's been so, um, so significant, so poignant in my own life story. So we're gonna begin a uh, little bit of housekeeping. There is a question and answer tab at the bottom. And typically I try to check that periodically throughout the session. So if a question comes to mind about anything that I've said, I invite you to type it in. We may not address questions um, as we're moving along simply because we did get off to a little bit of a late start, but rest assured that I'm gonna uh, save some time at the end where we'll go through them and we'll, we'll answer as many as we can, if not all of them. And the other thing is that this session is being recorded. So some of us like to, like to take copious notes. Others like to just sit back and let, let words wash over us. And then whatever seems to really um, resonate with us, that's what we take away with us. So depending on what your personal style is, uh, you can certainly jot down thoughts, notes that come to you as we're going through this next hour. But my invitation is maybe more to just kind of sit and just absorb it, let it wash over you. That way you won't really miss anything. Knowing that it's being recorded and you can always go back and watch it again, uh, especially if you wanna share it with some family members, share all this wonderful information that I'm gonna be passing along to you this evening on mindfulness. And we've all heard about mindfulness. 
but many of you may not really be sure just exactly what it is. It's a huge buzzword nowadays, and the scientific research is showing that it has the power to influence our life in quite a number of very beneficial ways. The scientific literature is showing that it can reduce stress, decrease symptoms of anxiety and depression, reduce chronic physical pain, boost our body's immune system, and help us to better fight disease. It can improve our attention and ability to concentrate, increase interpersonal skills, and improve relationships, stimulate creativity. And that's just a short list. But again, just exactly what is mindfulness? The definition that is used at UCLA, where I train to be a mindfulness facilitator, says that mindfulness is paying attention to our present moment experience with openness, curiosity, and a willingness to be with what is. Another complementary definition comes from John Kabat-Zinn, who says that mindfulness is simply settling into the present moment with a curious, non-judging awareness, allowing whatever is there to be there, and not trying to make things be any particular way. Too often in our lives, we're thinking about the next moment rather than living in this one. Hurrying through washing the dishes just so that we can sit and relax with a cup of tea. Or rushing through the work week just so that we can get to the weekend and do the things that we, quote, really enjoy. We spend an awful lot of our lives operating on autopilot. Many of us go through a large part of our day without ever even really being an active participant in many of the moments of our own life. How many times have you gotten into your car to drive somewhere, arrived at your destination, gotten out of the car, only to realize that you don't remember a single significant moment of the journey? Or gotten to the end of a shower and can't remember if you washed a particular body part or not? This isn't being mindful. Rather, this is being mindless. If each of us were to take just a few moments here and there during the course of our busy day to simply relax and take a few deep breaths, even this simple practice could make us feel more grounded, more aware. Our bodies are always living in the present moment and our breath is happening right here and right now. So the simple act of noticing our breath focuses us on the now, serves to bring us into the present moment. But our minds don't usually think that the present moment is interesting or exciting enough for us to hang out there. That's why it's always busy planning, remembering, judging, comparing. It is anywhere but present right here and right now. So where is it that our minds tend to go when they're not sharing the present moment with our bodies? Well, usually they're either replaying events of the past over and over in our head, regretting how we acted and wishing we had handled things differently, and wanting a do-over, or they're worrying about things yet to come that we often have little or no control over. A doctor visit that we're dreading or a meeting that we're, we're concerned about. Other times, our minds can travel off to places of fantasy and imagination as a kind of escape. And sometimes, we are actually living in the present moment. It just might not be the present moment that we would like to be in. Our minds are very fickle. If they aren't being stimulated by what's going on right here and right now in this moment, they go elsewhere to be entertained. And yet what's happening right here and right now is our life unfolding right in front of us. This is a moment that you will never ever have again. Why wouldn't you want to savor it? It was the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh who warned us not to miss our appointment with life. And John Lennon who said, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. The reason mindfulness is so valuable is that with mindfulness, we begin to cultivate the skills to be present with our life as it's actually unfolding right in front of us. And it, uh, it helps us to shift our perspectives so that we begin to see it all with a new appreciation. Appreciating it as it is actually happening. 
rather than only seeing it after the fact, once it's become a memory. It's like this, this idea of someone sitting at the breakfast table, reading the morning newspaper. Well, if we're not careful, that someone will be us, and we'll be reading about the events of our life like they're yesterday's news. So what is it about the present moment that it just isn't fulfilling enough? What's missing? Why is it so hard for us to be happy with things just the way they are? Oftentimes, the reason we can't be happy with the way things are right now in this moment is because we feel a certain set of conditions is necessary for happiness. We act like it's reserved for some future date after we've gotten everything crossed off of our to-do list. Like happiness is a destination rather than the journey. See if any of these scenarios sound familiar to you. When the kids grow up and go off to college, I'll finally be able to take some time for myself, and then I'll be happy. When I retire, my time will be my own, and then I'll be happy. When I get that promotion, I'll be set, then I'll be happy. When my house is paid off, when I get that big screen TV, when I get the new car, when summer vacation starts, when they find a vaccine, the list goes on and on. You fill in the blank. You can see where this is going. We are often wishing our lives away, looking ahead to some imagined Shangri-La moment, hurrying to get to the good stuff, rather than enjoying everything that is already present all around us right now in this moment. When we try to define the qualities for happiness, we actually end up limiting ourselves. Because when we try to get all the conditions just right, waiting for everything in our life to be just perfect before we feel we can be happy, we're only setting ourselves up for great disappointment and needless suffering. Because this is one struggle that you can never win. What mindfulness can teach us is that there is no perfect set of conditions and that the only one perfect moment is this moment. And here's a short little poem that speaks to that beautifully. This is called Perfection Will Be Built. The time comes when we realize that the ducks will never be in a row. It is the nature of ducks to fly about. The house will never be perfectly clean. It is the nature of a house to accommodate clutter. The project will never be done just right. It is the nature of projects to evolve into other projects. The future will never be perfectly secure. It is the nature of life to be unpredictable. Sit still and watch for a moment. Perfection will be built from all that is imperfect. And here's another one. This is called the life of a day. Like people or dogs, each day is unique and has its own personality quirks, which can easily be seen if you look closely. But usually they just pass, mostly unnoticed, unless they are wildly nice, like autumn ones full of red maple trees and hazy sunlight, or if they are grimly awful ones in a winter blizzard that kills the lost traveler with bunches of cattle. For some reason, we like to see days pass, even though most of us claim we don't want to reach our last one for a long time. We examine each day before us with barely a glance and say, nah, this isn't the one I've been looking for, and wait in a bored sort of way for the next, when we are convinced our lives will start for real. Meanwhile, this day is going by perfectly well adjusted, as some days are, with the right amounts of sunlight and shade and a light breeze scented with a perfume made from the mixture of fallen apples, corn stubble, dry oak leaves, and the faint odor of last night's meandering skunk. So now as a way of experiencing what awareness of the present moment is all about, I'm gonna lead you in a short little guided mindfulness meditation. So I invite you to begin by finding a comfortable position either seated in your chair or perhaps on a cushion on the floor. And notice your posture. You want to be sitting upright, 
and yet relax. Allow the hands to go wherever it feels natural for them to be. You might rest them gently on your thighs or clasp them together lightly in your lap. And if you feel comfortable doing so, gently close your eyes. This invites the gaze of attention inward and helps to leave the outside world behind. And if you're not comfortable with closing the eyes, that's okay. Perhaps just cast a soft gaze downward. Pick a spot on the floor, maybe four or five feet in front of you, and just, just let your attention rest there. Looking through, looking through a almost like a hazy, gauzy curtain. Everything softens. But if you're comfortable with the eyes closed, then I would invite you to do that. And then sense into how your physical body is feeling in this moment, how it's doing. Likely that's a reflection of how strenuous your day might have been. You can notice any place where you, where you sense some tightness or tension, maybe in the neck or the shoulders, muscles in the face and the jaw, maybe in the back. And if you find any of these places, just try gently breathing into those areas inviting them to soften, to relax. And you can scan through your body and notice if there's any areas of warmth or coolness, any places where you, you sense pressure or tingling. And then take two or three nice, deep, slow breaths and allow them to begin to relax you. And now allow your breath to settle into however it wants to be, long or short, deep or shallow, relaxed or tense. Don't try to change it. Allow it to be whatever it is. In this practice, we don't try to make the breath be any particular way. Just allow it to be however it is and bring fullness of attention to it. And as you sit, notice that the breath is naturally breathing itself. It takes no conscious effort on your part. And notice how it changes, breath by breath. No two breaths exactly the same. Each breath ever so subtly different from the one that came before. And different still from the one that is soon to follow. And then I invite you to notice wherever it is in your body that you feel the breath most clearly perhaps in the rising and falling of the belly, or in the gentle expansion and contraction of your chest. Maybe it's at the nostrils where the air enters cool and then exits warm. And then establish your attention in the place where you feel the breath most clearly and notice a full in-breath. and then a complete out-breath. And that little pause before the next in-breath comes in. It may be helpful to make a soft mental note in on the in-breath, out on the out-breath. The breath is your focus, your anchor. Think of it as your home base, the place you can always return to whenever the mind begins to wander, as it inevitably will. So let's just take a few moments now together to silently notice our breath. 
doing something we very rarely, if ever, tend to do, exploring what it's like to just simply breathe. And as you sit here quiet and still, attempting to focus on your breathing, likely what you'll notice is many other things coming and going in the meditation. Sounds appear and disappear. Body sensations are rising and passing. Emotions, thoughts, images coming and going. This is completely normal. This is called being human. Our minds are too intelligent to stay still for very long. They need to be doing something. So simply notice when your mind has wandered and then return to the breath, gently, kindly, guiding your attention back to the breath, back to the present moment. With mindfulness, we are cultivating this quality of awareness, something we were all born with. And we begin by simply noticing our breath. Mindfulness practice helps us to come into wise relationship with our life and everything that happens in our experience. Being present for our life as it is unfolding right in front of us. Now let your attention come back into the room, noticing your body as it's seated here in the chair, perhaps lying on the floor. And I will ring a bell to signal the end of the meditation. And I invite you to wait until all the sound has faded away and when you can hear it no longer and you are ready, you may open your eyes. And so that's a little experiential taste of settling into the present moment using your breath. Because as I mentioned, our bodies are breathing right here and right now. So coming out of the past and into the future and into the present is never any further away than just one nice deep slow breath. Now there's a number of different ways in which we can practice mindfulness meditation. We can practice formal meditation, as we just experienced, where we sit in a chair or on a cushion on the floor. We get quiet and still, allowing our breathing to slow down, our bodies to relax, opening up our awareness, relaxing our judgments. We can also practice informal mindfulness, which is where we simply become more present, more aware, while carrying out some of the everyday tasks and activities that we often tend to perform on autopilot, brushing our teeth, washing the dishes, making the bed, walking the dog, driving our car. A third way to practice is relational mindfulness, which is where we allow ourselves to really connect with another human being when we're engaged in conversation with them. Focusing on the words they're saying and allowing those words to be what grounds us in the moment, 
rather than only listening with half an ear while we're busy planning what we're going to say when it becomes our turn to speak. And when we do speak, speaking authentically and from the heart with intention and purpose, relational mindfulness. And when it comes to the first way, formal sitting meditation, there are even choices here. We can do breath meditation, as we just did, helping to calm us down and begin lowering our levels of stress and anxiety. Or you can use mindfulness to open your heart. We can use it to help us cultivate more positive emotions. And that is what we will be spending the rest of the evening exploring. You can think of these open-hearted qualities as all those virtuous qualities we came into the world with and which we exemplified as children, but which we often begin to lose touch with as we grow older and our worldview gets tainted. And yet they always still live within us and we never lose the ability to reconnect with them. In the mindfulness world, there are four main qualities of the heart, loving kindness, appreciative joy, compassion, and empathy. I'm sorry, equanimity. We don't want to confuse it with empathy as we're going to see very shortly. So I'll give you a brief overview of what each of these uh, qualities of the heart are. Loving kindness is defined as the authentic desire for someone to be happy. It can be a wish for we ourselves to be happy, for a loved one to be happy. We could even wish for someone we've never even met to be happy. But for loving kindness to be present, we first need understanding. Understanding is the essence of love and kindness. If you cannot understand, you cannot love. Joy could be defined as a feeling, uh, a sense of serenity and contentment with the entire range of human emotions. And there's a very special kind of joy known as appreciative joy, which is when we feel a true happiness for the good fortune of others. Compassion is the authentic desire to relieve suffering, whether it be our own suffering or the suffering of another. And for compassion to be present, you must first be able to acknowledge and accept suffering. Equanimity is the fourth virtue. This is the ability to be okay with all the inevitable ups and downs of life whatever the circumstances. Understanding that even the unpleasant things in life are often only temporary. And learning to ride that wave rather than swimming against the tide. This provides great ease and freedom in our life. In fact, freedom is a synonym for equanimity. And it is these last two, compassion and equanimity, which we're going to focus on this evening. Now, we've already defined the open-hearted quality of compassion as the authentic desire to ease the suffering of another human being. Or it can even be the desire to relieve our own suffering. And it is this extra element of wanting to actually do something about the suffering that takes it beyond empathy, which is where we feel what the suffering person is feeling, and we can identify with their pain, but that's as far as it goes. And compassion is definitely different than pity, which has an element of aversion to it. Compassion is born out of the knowing that we will all suffer at one time or another. We are human beings, and being human is not a casual thing to be taken lightly. And compassion cannot be present unless you first have the ability to accept suffering, to acknowledge when it is present, and to allow it to be there. You cannot have love and kindness without first experiencing suffering and loss. It is impossible to be healed by the light without first experiencing the sorrow of the darkness. And here's another little poem that I wanna share with you that speaks to that concept beautifully. This is called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. 
Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness it raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. But our culture is not comfortable with acknowledging or accepting suffering. It can be seen as a sign of weakness. In our society, the sick and the old are often locked away in rest homes or assisted living senior centers. But what we all need to understand is that suffering is normal and it's okay. It's okay to be sad, anxious, sick, hurt, or afraid. And compassion isn't just different from empathy in the way we feel it in our hearts. The two are actually quite different in the way our brains experience them. Emotional empathy activates the amygdala. Remember, this is that feeling what the suffering person is feeling. Empathy activates the amygdala, that tiny little almond-shaped part of the brain, which is part of our primitive mechanism for survival. The amygdala evaluates our environmental circumstances to discern, determine if something is a threat or not. It reacts much more rapidly and thoroughly to negative stimuli than to positive. The bad back carries much more weight in the amygdala's world than the good. And when the amygdala is stimulated, our fight or flight emergency response system is activated. And the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that regulates our emotions and influences our well-being and our ability to make sound, rational decisions, is forced to take a back seat. One research study showed that when we have emotional empathy, feeling exactly what the suffering person is feeling, our amygdala is activated just as it is for them. The researchers used functional MRI to obtain imaging scans that revealed that the same parts of the brain light up in both individuals. Even though it is not happening to us, the brain experiences it as if it is. But in a follow-up study where novice meditators were instructed in compassion practices, which stimulate feelings of love, and a caring concern for those who are suffering, the researchers found that a completely different set of circuitry lit up in the brain, the circuits connected to warmth and love, ones which mimic feelings of parental concern. And this occurred after only eight hours of meditation training. So now we're going to experience what it's like to meditate on the open-hearted quality of compassion. And often when we begin this meditation, we might bring an image to mind of someone who is suffering, whether we know them personally or not. And then we focus our meditation on them and their well-being, usually by repeating some phrases silently to ourselves. But we can just as easily meditate on self-compassion for those times when we ourselves are the ones who are suffering. And this might be quite appropriate given the current climate of the times in which we find ourselves. So now I'll lead you in a little guided meditation on compassion. So settle in your chair and allow your body to soften, sensing if there's any tightness or tension, breathing into those places, inviting them to relax. And see if you can gently begin to let go, to disentangle, to let the body gently breathe itself. And put your awareness into your heart, settling into a place of stillness, a place where there's no past and no future. All there is, is now. 
and trust yourself as you are present on this earth to learn the great art of compassion. Compassion is the authentic desire to help ease the suffering of another human being. It is a softening, an opening of the heart. And self-compassion is inclining the heart in the direction of our own suffering or stress. We all experience difficulties in this world, things that challenge us, things that test us. Sometimes we experience sadness or conflicted feelings, second guessing, or situations that cause us to judge ourselves. We have all suffered. This is simply one of the things that makes us human. So I invite you to recall an image or a memory or bring to mind a situation that has caused you personally some suffering. It could be something you're going through currently, or maybe something from your past. And if suffering is too harsh a word, then perhaps just stress or worry. And don't choose the worst thing that comes to mind. We want to be sure that our mindfulness is strong enough to work with it. Perhaps you choose a certain way that you might have treated someone that was contrary to your true nature. Or perhaps it was an unkindness that someone else had visited upon you that caused you stress or suffering. Or maybe you let someone down, you failed to live up to an expectation that they had set for you. But see if something comes to mind. And when you can have this image or this memory or this thought in place, you might just quietly say to yourself, this hurts, I'm suffering here. This is stressful. And simply notice what is there, how it feels in your body. If there's any hurt or sadness, what does that feel like on a visceral level? Does it feel empty or heavy? Does it feel dark? What does suffering or stress feel like for you? See if you can sense into that. And then say to yourself, and know in your heart that this is true. Right now, many other people all over the world feel the very same way. Right now, there are hundreds of people feeling just as I do, hurting just the same as me. I am not alone. Suffering is a part of life. We all struggle. I see that and I know that I am not alone. Let the fact of our common humanity settle in for a moment. The simple truth of how connected we all are. Connected by our hurts, our struggles, our suffering, our wish to simply be happy and have a good life. And when you gain a sense of how this feels, just accept the truth of it. This suffering, this stress, might be a very real part of your life. And the only way we can often make peace with it is to bring, bring it to bear, to shine some light upon it. Acknowledge the suffering. Allow it to be there and see if it's possible to hold that with a kind heart, a gentle, nurturing, compassionate heart. Perhaps you even place a hand over your own heart or give yourself a gentle hug. You might think back to a time when you were very young and you can remember being comforted by a loving parent or a grandparent at a time when you needed it the most. So in this meditation, we just let whatever feelings come, we allow them to surface and gently begin to wash over you. As you breathe softly with your own 
heart space. Appreciating your courage, your strength, and your vulnerability. And then take a couple of nice deep breaths. Now we'll ring the bell to signal the end of the meditation. And now the truth is that sometimes we get so caught up in our desire to relieve the suffering of another person that we lose the ability to keep our compassionate feelings from turning us into an emotional empath. Because the situation, whatever it is, just simply hits too close to home. And this is particularly true when we're caring for a family member or another loved one who's suffering from a severe illness, where the prognosis may not be very good. As a caregiver in a situation like this, you have to be very careful that you don't allow yourself to become a victim of what is called compassion burnout. This is when we are so empathetic in feeling what the suffering person is feeling that we become physically and emotionally drained from the caregiving experience. Ultimately, we might begin to wonder if we're even being effective at all. And we often begin to doubt ourselves. The most powerful antidote to empathetic burnout is to begin practicing more equanimity. And this is the other open-hearted quality that we're going to be exploring this evening. And equanimity is this gentle acceptance of the idea that things are as they are. It's a state of even-mindedness and non-reactivity where we see that there are many circumstances in our life which we simply do not have the power to change. And we learn to be okay with that. We realize that everything in life is temporary, impermanent. And we save ourselves a lot of needless suffering when we are able to accept the truth of this. In this moment, for better or for worse, these are simply the conditions of my life. But I know that these two will change. And the way that I like to look at all of this is that the key to avoiding compassion burnout is in not allowing ourselves to become weighted down with the pain and suffering of another person. We don't check out from it, but we begin to practice more equanimity as we accept the reality of it. And this can help prevent us from becoming burned out. We let go of what we cannot change at the same time that we cultivate open-hearted qualities for that person. And this allows our desire to relieve suffering to be present without becoming bound up in the suffering itself. And so now I'll lead you in a short little equanimity meditation so you'll understand what it's like to sit with that noble virtue. So I invite you to settle into a comfortable meditation posture Closing the eyes if it feels comfortable. And just feeling your body as it's present in the room. Feeling it in this moment. Noticing what is pleasant and what is not so pleasant about your body. Noticing what things you might like to change about the way your body feels in this moment, if you only could. And then reflect back for a moment on whatever thoughts or feelings might have arisen for you in our compassion meditation. Some of the ways in which you might be struggling in your own life right now. We have all experienced what is often called the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows of this being human. There can be so much heartache in life. So many things that we wish were different, and yet so many of them, we simply do not have the power to change. Think of how challenging many of life's events can be, and how sometimes we work so very hard to change things, to fix them. Sometimes we're successful, but often we're not. Think of how much needless stress and worry and pain we could save ourselves 
if we could just learn to accept things as they are. Accept what we often never had the power to change in the first place. If we could just simply say, things are as they are. May I be with things just as they are. I am as I am. May I be with myself just as I am. You are as you are. May I accept you just as you are. My life is as it is. May I accept my life just as it is. No matter how much I want things to change, they are as they are. May I learn to be undisturbed by the coming and going of events. I know that pleasure and pain arise, and both pleasure and pain will pass away. May I learn to see the arising and passing of all things with peace and balance. May I learn to move in rhythm with this dance called life. Things are as they are. May I accept things just as they are. I am as I am. May I accept myself just as I am. You are as you are. May I accept you just as you are. Your happiness, your unhappiness, depends on your actions, not on my wishes for you. Think for a moment about how differently your life might look if you weren't so busy trying to make things be any particular way, but could let go, disentangle, and allow things to be just exactly as they are. How differently might your life look? And so here are some things that might be intentions that you could set to cultivate a little more equanimity, almost like, almost like a little mantra. So I'll share some with you and see if any of them resonate with you, or perhaps you might come up with one of your own. May I be content in the knowing that everything belongs. May my heart be big enough to hold all the joys and all the countless sorrows without feeling overwhelmed. May I be spacious and at ease. May I learn to live with a peaceful heart. May I open to life just as it is. And may I be at peace with life just as it is. So take a couple of nice deep breaths. I'll ring the bell. And when the sound has faded, you may open your eyes. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I just want to share a few closing thoughts on equanimity and then we'll kind of wrap it up. I want you to understand that equanimity does not mean that we allow others to take advantage of us. It's not like we're in a situation of abuse and we just say, oh, that's how they are. It is what it is. Equanimity is not that at all. It doesn't mean that we do not act when it is morally right to do so. Equanimity is a very deeply connected state of the heart. And equanimity is not giving up more a process of letting go, letting go of the things that we just don't have the power to change. And the futility of trying to change things that cannot be changed, or getting lost in the minutia of life rather than using mindful awareness to see the bigger picture, is reflected in this quote by John Kabat-Zinn that I love so very much. He says, we're often living our lives as if all we're really doing is just simply moving around the deck chairs on the Titanic. With equanimity, we can help ourselves to suffer less when we begin to accept the unpredictable and inevitable nature of life, being open-minded and receptive to whatever life brings our way. 
resisting the temptation to label things as good or bad. From a mindfulness perspective, they're neither good nor bad, they just are. And so, in tying this all together, maybe the takeaway from all of this is this idea that both science and mindfulness practices converge in this belief that we humans have an innate bias toward living these four virtuous qualities, kindness, joy, compassion, and equanimity. In regard to these qualities, Eastern spiritual traditions believe that we come into the world with an innate bias toward altruistic intentions. In fact, infrared eye tracking studies of six month old babies showed that their, their attention was drawn to helpful graphics before harmful graphics. We had a nice little animation of this cute little googly eyed character with these big glasses that was pushing a wagon up a set of railroad tracks. And when he got to the top, this other character popped out from the side and pushed the wagon back down. And the, the lovable hero would push it back up at the top, the other fellow would push it back down. And then this third character came in and helped our hero push the wagon up the hill. And what the eye tracking on these infants showed is that their attention was drawn to the helpful character, not the hindering character. And research also shows that the benefits of meditating on open-hearted qualities like kindness or compassion, whether it's for ourselves or for others, manifest themselves in our actions and behaviors much more quickly than does any increased ability to cope with stress that comes through simply performing relaxation breathing meditation. And this may be due to a biological preparedness because our brain is already primed in this direction. And this fits in very nicely with the foundation of Eastern spiritual practices from which much of modern secular mindfulness is descended because Eastern practices believe that our true nature is a good nature. So perhaps what mindfulness is actually doing is reconnecting us with the basic good nature of our own being. And that is what I would love to be the take home message for you this evening. And I know that it's just seven o'clock and we may not have time to um, address any questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to Monica and she can decide. It looks like we do have a few. So Monica, you can, you can let our participants know how you'd like to proceed. Okay, thank you, Clyde. Uh, yeah, we do have some time for some questions. So we're gonna move to that portion of our presentation. And um, let me just start by sharing one from one of our attendees. And the question is, let me share it with everybody. The question is, can you expand on relational mindfulness in one's workplace or career? It seems to be an advanced practice that requires social interactions instead of traditional closed eye meditation. That's a wonderful question. I, I, I've actually done full day workshops on relational mindfulness. And that's why I wanted everybody to get a sort of a little overview of the different ways that this, that this can apply to our life. And usually what we do, there's a lot of little techniques with relational mindfulness. What you're doing essentially, you noticed in the breath meditation that we were focusing on the breath as a way to, to, add, to anchor ourselves or, or root us in the moment because our minds are always going to wander. So we need something to come back to. You can do walking meditation. That's a wonderful form of informal mindfulness where you just let the, the contact of your feet on the ground and the sensation in your legs be what anchors you in the moment. With relational mindfulness, when we do these interactive uh, dyads we often do, it's where we have two people facing each other and you are using the words of the other person to be what grounds you in the moment. So there's a speaker and a listener and you choose a question. Oftentimes it's a repeating question. Like I might choose the question that says, tell me something that makes you happy. And so this, this, the, uh, the person who's the questioner will ask that. Then the other person will respond. They'll, they'll choose one thing that makes them happy. And then when they've answered, the person who asked the question will say, thank you. And then they will ask the exact same question again. Tell me something that makes you happy. And now the respondent will come up with a completely different answer. Thank you. You ask it again. And you usually do this for a minute and a half, two minutes. And then what this shows, see, is that we come out of our, we come out of our minds and we come into our bodies because if we're listening to that person give these answers, a number of things happen. Because first of all, 
If we focus on their words and not what we're going to say when it's our turn, we are truly present in the moment. We're not looking ahead to the future. Also because of this wonderful thing called mirror neurons, almost like the idea of the empathy where our amygdala is, is activated when we're feeling the suffering of another person. When we're tuning into the happiness and joy of another person, those same wonderful parts of our brain light up just as it's lighting up in the other individual. So what, tell me something that makes you happy is wonderful because our heart is being opened and warmed when we listen to these things that this other person finds in, in life that makes them happy and we are actually becoming happier. So there's this wonderful connection that is formed in the moment. And, it's, and it just starts with this idea of anchoring ourselves in their words. And then, you know, it's, it's also this idea when you do an exercise like this and you do it for more than, you know, a couple of minutes, we all have pat responses to questions that if somebody says to you, you know, um, what are you grateful for? Well, my family, my job, you know, whatever. You keep asking this to somebody 5, 10, 15, 20 times. They're going to have to start to search a little bit more deeply to find out what they are truly grateful for. So it's a wonderful way to reach within ourselves. So that's a diet, that's one way. The other, the other way that I love to do sometimes is something called lightning rounds, where you have people, you just go around the room and you pick a question that can be answered in one word, a couple words, a short phrase, and then you just ask that question rapid fire. So you might start at one end and you, the question might be, you know, um, what's your favorite time of day? You know, and somebody will say morning, next person might say afternoon, lunchtime, next person says sunset. Then the next question might, and you do this very rapid fire, so nobody has time to think about what they're gonna respond, you know? And then you might say, if you really knew me, you would know that I blank. And then they fill this in. You might say, what did you wanna be when you grew up? When you were a child, what did you wanna be when you grew up? Then the next question might be, what did you actually become? And what's wonderful about these kinds of exercises is that if you're not thinking about how you're going to answer the question, if instead you are focusing on the words of the other people, you are coming into the present moment like nothing else can do. Okay? And because usually what happens is whatever first came to your mind, by the time they come around the room and they hit you, you're going to say something different anyway. And what I've had, what I've had told to me so many times over the years when I do these things in a workplace, somebody will come up and will say, you know, I've been, I've been in the cubicle next to Joe for 10 years. And I just learned more about him in the last two hours than I learned in the whole preceding 10 years. So in, in terms of team building, camaraderie, and just another way to be present with your life in the moment, relational mindfulness is wonderful. So thank you, that was a great question. Um, I would like to take this one that just says, do you have recommended training for someone who wants to become a Tai, tai Chi teacher or a meditation teacher? Um, and I have lots of uh, recommendations because I also am a Tai Chi teacher. And I've been doing that for a couple of years and I got into that because I went to a couple of Tai Chi retreats and it seemed to me a logical extension of the mindfulness and meditation. Because Tai Chi, like yoga, like Pilates, is a very mindful form of movement. You focus on your body. You let everything else that doesn't matter in the moment just kind of wash away. And so you focus on your mind and your body sort of coming together and connecting because the mind drives the body. And so when you let everything else, all your worries, all your thoughts, all your plans sort of wash away, the only thing that's left is an awareness of your physical body. And so Tai Chi has some of the same benefits, just like yoga, just like Pilates, some of the same benefits as uh, any form of mindful movement exercise is that we come into the moment, we feel empowered in connecting with our body. We, we improve our coordination, our balance, our strength, and just this, this sense of ease and serenity that can come about when we're truly one with our body, you know, one with our breathing. Again, it's a very mindful state. So you can take mindfulness, you know, sitting on the cushion, solitary form of meditation. You can practice it informally by being more aware of the temperature of the water and the feel of the sponge when you're washing dishes. You can have relational mindfulness. You can have mindful movement as a form of mindfulness. And I, I, I trained through an organization called the Tai Chi for Health Institute. 
which is that was actually started by a physician who's also a Tai Chi master. And they're worldwide, but their office is in Australia. And they have seminars all across the United States. You can get certified to teach various different styles of Tai Chi that are very applicable to healthcare. Because as a physical therapist, I learned styles that work for fall prevention, arthritis, and this kind of thing. And then as far as meditation teaching and training and facilitation, uh, hands down, I would invite you to do exactly what I did and check out the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center, MARC, M-A-R-C. And if you go on um, um, MARC, M-A-R-C, dot U-C-L-A dot E-D-U, not only can you find out lots more information about the various training programs that they have, there's also a whole wealth of guided meditations. And if you're new to meditation, that's a wonderful way to start because once we see how the mind likes to wander, sometimes when there's a little guidance, that also helps bring us back and focus our attention. So definitely check out Mark. They have a um, year-long teacher training, which I went through back in 2017. So you're actually officially certified to lead mindfulness workshops. There's only a handful of um, entities across the whole world where you can have that done. UCLA is one. It's a premier place to have it done. They even have something called the Intensive Practice Program, which is a year-long thing where you just uh, meet once a month, and it's a nice prerequisite almost to applying to the year-long teacher training. So definitely uh, marc.ucla.edu for training, for meditations, uh, for all kinds of events. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you also for giving me the opportunity to, to uh, talk about UCLA, which has been um, so influential in my own um, personal journey. Thank you, Clyde. I actually have a question. Um, I was wondering, is there a recommendation for how frequent you should meditate or how many minutes so that you become more effective at your meditations? Yeah, yeah. Great question. That's a wonderful question. <clears throat> now, so there's four things. I'll just tell you this briefly. There's four things that you want to really consider if you're thinking about cultivating a meditation practice, a sitting practice. And so the first one is going to be location. Where are you going to do it? So now just whatever thought went into tonight for, for the location you were going to be in for this webinar, you know, that would be where you would want to be choosing a spot to meditate. You want it to be a place where it's relatively quiet, you can get away from distractions, and the moment that you enter that space, it's almost like it signals to your body to relax. And so it might be a, it might be a spare room, a library, you know, but it doesn't have to be a room with, with you know, fountains and flowers. It can be in the middle of your living room, as long as it's at a time when you're free from distractions and noise. And then also, position and that's I can't really demonstrate to you because there's you know sitting on a cushion on the floor as we get older that becomes a little bit more challenging because we don't we don't uh, uh, bend our body into knots quite as well as we did when we were decades younger but sitting meditation can be done on a cushion on the floor it can be done in a chair meditation can also be done standing it can be done lying down and it can be done walking so that would be sort of the position and then time of day this is very important because you need to pick a time of day when you're going to be alert. You don't want to be falling asleep. That's why the majority of people choose first thing in the morning. It doesn't have to be first thing in the morning. It can just as easily be when you get home from work. It could be before you go to bed. Sometimes it's a wonderful way to relax, almost like, a, like an invitation to settle into sleep. You might even meditate a couple of times a day. Most people tend to do it in the morning. It's almost like exercise. They like to know that they've got it done. It's a nice way to start their day. But really, it's choosing a time when you have those five, 10 minutes, whatever it might be, and you won't be disturbed and you're relaxed. You might want to, you might have your, your greatest sense of relaxation in the morning before things have started to come your way. You might want to seek the relaxation at the end of a tough work day. And then the last question, which is really what you were asking, is how long? And this is a really, really good question. What the research has shown with meditation and time spent meditating is that you are so much better off if you meditate every day for a very short time period, five minutes, 10 minutes, than it is if you meditate once a week for an hour. The, the benefits come on faster and they are much longer lasting. So if you can, and everybody has five minutes a day, we really do. 
You know, you could get to work five minutes early and sit in your car before you go into the office and just sit quietly, turn the radio off, turn the car off, just close your eyes and breathe. That could be your five minute meditation. If you set the bar too high in the beginning, if you say, oh, well, I'm gonna, John Cabot's in, he, he says meditate 45 minutes a day. Well, if you set the bar too high, what you're gonna find is you are often just setting yourself up for failure. You want it to be a goal that is realistic, that is reachable. So if you do five minutes a day and that feels really nice after a while, it doesn't seem like it's long enough, go to 10 minutes a day, go to 15 minutes, but do it in that fashion. So even if you don't meditate every day, even if you meditate five days a week for five minutes at a time, this is how I would really recommend starting out. And because when you gain that sense of relaxation, that sense of clarity, and it does give clarity. That's why so many very creative people meditate. You know, Paul McCartney, Clint Eastwood, Mick Jagger, Kurt Russell, you know, all these people. How, how do you, where do you think? a lot of the creative inspiration comes from. Because when we turn down the noise on our life, all of this creativity that is living inside of us, just below the surface, it bubbles up. And so, you know, when you, when you get this feeling of clarity and relaxation, trust me, you're gonna want more. And so it's self-perpetuating snowball effect in a very, very, very good way. So that's, thank you for that one. I don't know if, if we should, uh, if we should end with that, what do you have? What's your feeling, Monica? Yeah, I think maybe we should end with that and um, just let people know that um, an email will be going out to all the attendees with Clyde's contact information. So if you have any other questions or you just want to touch ba base with Clyde on some other topics of mindfulness, please feel free to reach out to him. Um, my contact information will also be in the email and I welcome your suggestions for future programming or feedback or if you wanna just learn more about uh, the UCLA Alumni Association and how to get engaged with an alumni network. Um, I'd really love to thank Clyde for such a great presentation and leading us through the mindful um, meditation guidelines. Um, I'm very mindful of the time and effort it took for you to pr provide this webinar to us. So for that, we are extremely grateful. I'd like to also thank Jacob Sproul at UCLA Alumni for helping to coordinate this event and to UCLA Alumni Association for their continued support. So with that, I'll thank all the attendees again for joining us tonight. Um, stay safe and as always, go Bruins.